Welcome to Community Watch, and today we'll be having a fascinating conversation about the Negro League Baseball and the writers behind that league. Stay with us. We'll be right back right after this. If you're looking for a new pet that your family will cherish every day, consider adopting from a shelter. Shelters are the best places to find a new pet. That's where you'll discover healthy, loyal, and loving animals eager to become a part of your family. A person is the best thing to happen to a shelter pet. So bring home your new buddy today. To find out more, visit the shelterpetproject.org. Welcome to Community Watch. Greg. Doug. Uh, How are you? I'm great in yourself. I'm a little damp today, but otherwise I'm fine. But I love it though. You I, love the rain? I love the rain. I love I love the flooding <laughs> until it's <laughs> dangerous, but you know, I like to see that, yeah. We've had a lot of rain the last couple of weeks. Um, makes me yearn for spring though, because on the other end of all this, well, if you visit California, certain parts like Riverside, it is literally a desert. And when I go there, I'm just fascinated by, it's just, I just call it Big Rock Candy Mountain. You have all these huge mountains, just rock, no green whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And contrast that to living here, but then they very seldom get any rain. And so yeah. I just, I love the rain. Yeah. You're, you are looking forward to baseball season, though. No, you know, I've never been a, <laughs> I've never been a, that's your thing. <laughs> I can't say that I'm looking forward to it, but, you know, I am amazed at the lack of African Americans in baseball now compared to years before, because growing up, there were, you know, African Americans were just as much part of baseball as everything else, but over the years, I sense, not, you know, it may not be true, that it's been a rapid decline of African Americans mm -hmm. in baseball. So much so that I know some HBCUs, majority of their baseball team are white, but they have to have a team. And I'm just wondering, you know, when did that happen? I know with the rise of stuff like AAU basketball and just year-round sports, but on a professional level, you just don't hear those, the name or see those faces that it, when I was growing up, and even I wasn't even a baseball fan. Yeah. But So maybe you know, we can get into some of that. I wonder, too, if some of the the information that's coming out about the dangers of playing football, if we'll see more people look at baseball as an option. No, we're a violent, on, we're a violent country. You know, we, yeah, we know the trauma, but hey, we, we still willing to pay to see people hurt themselves. So I don't see that coming soon. Uh -huh. yeah. Well, um, our guest today, uh, Dr. Carroll from Berry College, is going to talk to us about the Negro Leagues in particular, because we have a, a guest yeah. coming to town in a few weeks, and uh, or actually pretty soon, actually mm -hmm. not a few weeks. And so we're going to talk about that event coming up. But um, we had an opportunity to have him on the show as it's one of his areas of expertise, so it should be a, a fascinating conversation. So stay with us. We will be back with our guest right after this. Your life is filled with opportunities to show the world you can take charge. It's waking up each day with a mission. It's working each day toward a goal. It's choosing to rise. It's charging forward with a purpose. It's changing the course of your life and taking charge of your future. If you're ready to be a take charger, enroll at Georgia Highlands College today. Welcome back to Community Watch. We're very happy to have with us today Dr. Brian Carroll from Berry College. Welcome. Well, thank you for having me. Um, I think where I, where I want to begin is just to get a sense of where you're, because uh, the Negro Leagues is just one 
of a number of of areas of expertise that that you bring to the table. I was just wondering where that interest began for you. Yeah, it's kind of a fun personal story. I'm in graduate school. Uh, we have a deadline to bring a topic submission for a, a semester-long research project in historical methods, and I'm at a loss. And I think, well, what do I love? I love baseball. So I'm rooting around the National Baseball Hall of Fame's archives and library, and I stumble on the name Wendell Smith. And he's for the first time in American history, he's depicted in uh, a major film in 42. He's the guy you might remember driving Jackie Robinson around and trying to tell Jackie it's not just about you, it's about all of us. That's my guy. And history has largely ignored him. Um, so when I stumbled on Wendell Smith, he was the sports editor of the Pittsburgh Courier, the, the largest black newspaper in the country in the 30s and 40s. I got to write about this guy. So that was the beginning, and then it, it, that was two, uh, 2000, yeah, 2000, year 2000. So for two decades, I've, I've been immersed in this wonderful trove of American history. Um, and I mean, we have some local connections to this too. I mean, it's uh, the Negro Leagues existed in this area. Absolutely, they were vibrant yeah. in the South. Uh, yeah, so, and that's an interesting um, puzzle to how to categorize. So when you say professional baseball leagues, what do you mean? And if we define that as players paid to play baseball, primarily if not exclusively, there weren't many, and they weren't in the South. They were in the Midwest. They were in the population centers. But, but the next tier down, which isn't quite minor leagues, that's not fair, but the next tier down, uh, the South, was baseball crazy in the black community just as it was baseball crazy in every other community? Uh, such that, yeah, locally the Lindale Dragons is one of the names that comes up quite a bit. Um, so, yeah, this is a taproot into local history as well. Uh. So, when you talk about the local teams like the Lindale Dragons, where, what do, I guess, where does the Negro, Negro League, I guess, kind of because you're talking about professional, yes, the satchel pages and people like that, right? Those are all in the, like I guess you say the urban areas or the major cities, major cities, and so, and that's the story that we'd like to yes. celebrate this month um, with Larry Lester coming to Berry College and to the Rome History Museum, just a couple blocks away, and that is the story of the birth of the Negro National League, and then soon after that the Negro American League. These are the leagues of substance. These are professional leagues in every respect. And it's, it's the birth and, and growth of these leagues that sets the stage for a Jackie Robinson to be able to emerge to integrate baseball, if by one player you mean integration, which is problematic. But if that's the case, that occurs in 45 through 47. Um, so yeah, you're talking Chicago, New York, Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, Detroit, St. Louis, in fact, that, that is the roster of mm. cities for the first Negro League of Substance. So I'm assuming that that league was made up of, I guess, some of these local leagues, people that was good enough to go to that next level. How did it, how did it work? That's right. A always. And so that's the story of Butch Haynes here locally. Um, that's the story of, I'm just drawing a blank on, I don't want to get his first name wrong, but Mr. Scruggs, who pitched for the Kansas City Monarchs in the late 50s, will be coming to Rome as part of these events as well. They would play, uh, they would get discovered. Um, in the case of Mr. Haynes, he went to a training camp um, in Birmingham at Rickwood Field and is discovered. Um, he's offered a contract by the Detroit Stars. He realizes he's not, he's not sure this is the life, you know, the, the life on the road and, and, and all that that meant was right for him. But there was constant shuttling of players up and down, depending on the fortunes of the league, of the, the salaries they were able to offer, or in the case of uh, Satchel Page, worth so much to any team he ever played for, he just constantly jumped for the better contract. So he played for virtually everyone. You know, we, uh, we took a group of our students to tour Rickwood Field. It's been about a year or so ago. 
Um, and I, I have to say that our students were not particularly interested in the tour until they found out that the movie, movie 42 right. had been filmed there, the games had been filmed there. Yeah, and Inglefield in uh, Chattanooga as well. Because uh, uh, Rickwood Field is like one of the last remaining That's right. wood, wood ballparks, ballparks played in by primarily black league teams. That's right. Now it looks the way it does for the movie Ty Cobb, um, and it looks beautiful. I mean, it's it's retro. It's mm -hmm. it's vintage. Um, so it's a yeah. What a, I'm sure that was a great experience. It was. It was. Uh, and apparently they used it to be quite a few different locations in the film. They just dressed it up differently right. for each game where it was supposed to be a, a field in a different location. Right. Um, so. The leagues, did they, what happened to them when Major League Baseball was integrated? I mean, when, was it a quick a light switch? Or? A light switch. Yes. I mean, the writers, and that's my focus, the, the role of the black press in this great story, um, what a dilemma. They've been promoting, building up, in some cases running, helping to run the teams, and certainly the record keepers and usually the official scorers of the games in the black leagues suddenly Jackie's in in Brooklyn and he's traveling to St. Louis and Philly there was a dilemma philosophically but in terms of history and commerce they rushed over to the to the Dodgers and so did the fan bases so the Negro Leagues uh, really uh, quickly began losing their vitality with Jackie in Brooklyn so it's really the, su the success of Jackie Robinson. And one thing, it's a thing that's celebrated on one hand, but at the same time it brought about the end yes. of a league that served a, a greater population than since then. Yes, that, see that's such an important part of the story, is that you have this beautiful flower of culture, of achievement, of merit, of, of entertainment and amusement. It's just a beautiful thing. Black baseball was beautiful. And it has to be cut, I think most would agree, it has to be sacrificed on this altar of something we call segregation. Although one player here, one player there is that segregation. Um, it takes a long time. It takes till 1957 for every team in the major leagues to have one player mm -hmm. of color. It takes the, the early to mid 60s before spring training gets desegregated. Um, so yes, that's to me, that's the, that's, that's the great cost of yeah. all of this, is that that beautiful thing has to be basically impaled for this presumably, and I would agree, greater good. Yeah. But it comes at a cost. Huge cost. <laughs> Huge cost. That's right. Yeah. So there needs to be an accounting um, because, and we see this in old footage of Jackie, you know, black ball was a different style. It was yeah. an exciting style. You see him yeah. flitting off of second base and just messing with the minds of white pitchers. Well, let me ask you that because I was thinking when you was talking, I was thinking about the bingo long traveling, traveling all-stars. All -stars. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering with your research, how accurate of a depiction is that movie of <sighs> right. black baseball at the time? Uh, Negro leaguers, in my experience, hate that movie because it fails to capture really anything of the life of a Negro League ball player at the expense of hyperbole and, mm -hmm. and cartoonish uh, set pieces. Um, there's some interesting aspects of it, including the, there's the, the uh, female owner in, the, in that depiction who's based loosely on the uh, Effa Manley, who owns with her husband the Newark Stars from which Monty Irvin came to integrate the New York Giants. So there's some cute things in there, and Richard Pryor is Richard Pryor. Richard He's Pryor. amazing. But mm -hmm. in terms of authenticity and really communicating in the way that Bull Durham is cited by major league ball players, mm -hmm. is, yeah, that's that's what it okay. felt like. You don't get that same appreciation for okay. that movie. Mm -hmm. Fun movie though. Oh yeah. Well, if nothing else, it'll, if it at least uh, creates some curiosity. It's something. About Negro that's Lean. right. Yeah. That's how I feel about Forty Two. Finally, thank you. Wendell Smith is included in this narrative that only had room for Jackie, Branch, Ricky, and maybe a picture of Abe Lincoln in the background. And that was it. <laughs> it was it. Well, uh, we're coming up on a break here uh, shortly. Um, 
But I want to ask you um, about Wendell Smith. Please. Um, but I also am curious about the fans of black baseball and what happens to them um, when integration mm -hmm. changes baseball. Yeah. But we've got to take a break here. We'll be back with a lot more. Don't go away. and high school students drop out every school day. That's a line of desks more than four miles long. We can keep students in school. Visit boostup.org and take the first step. But, yeah, so. Welcome back to Community Watch. We're having a conversation with Dr. Brian Carroll, Berry College who is uh, an expert in the Negro Leagues and the black press. Um, when the Negro Leagues, or, or when professional baseball began to, to integrate, it was a very gradual mm -hmm. uh, thing to, to occur. What options did the fan base have of you know, who, uh, the, the people who, who attended the black baseball games, did they have, were they abandoned as well? Well, they, so that, that's a good question. I don't, I don't have deep knowledge of fan bases city by city, but certainly the, the trends were to suddenly become, and Kobe Bryant is a good recent example of how this might occur. We're all Kobe Bryant fans now, because what a tragic way to lose someone who had accomplished so much. Um, such that, you know, the, the, there was a quick reaffiliation with the Dodgers. Everybody became a Dodgers fan. Such that the train lines would set up special routes to deliver fans from the heartland into, say, Chicago for a series with the Cubs and the Dodgers or into St. Louis for the Browns or Cards against the Dodgers. Uh, it, w it was fairly immediate in that respect, but it was also generational, such that if you were an older fan, you wanted you liked your team. Younger fans more so quickly adopted the, the new integrated major leagues. And the name Negro Leagues, Negro Leagues, became increasingly problematic as the younger generation started to see a better future. If I could, that's oversimplistic, but I think that gets at part of what yeah, you're asking. Yeah. It's compl complex. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you asked about Wendell Smith, so I'd love yes, to return yes. to him. Let's talk about the role he played and, and the black press played in baseball. Yeah, I love the, the, the story of Wendell Smith. He grows up um, in the Ford estate, meaning Henry Ford, which is the Barry connection, I guess, if you will. Grows up in the Henry Ford estate. His dad is the chef to the Ford family. He doesn't know segregation. This is a giant estate and household. He's confronted with segregation when he pitches his American League team to a one to nothing victory over an all-white team, and the losing pitcher gets signed a Major League Baseball contract, and he doesn't. So he, even his catcher, Mike Tresh, who would later play for the Tigers, gets signed that day, not Wendell Smith. So Smith goes on to West Virginia State College and becomes editor of his, local, of his college newspaper, and then his first job out of school is the Pittsburgh Courier, where immediately he begins campaigning, working behind the scenes, doing everything he can think of to bring integration about. Um, and so he does this for 25 years uh, to lead up to the penultimate moment when Branch Rickey invites Wendell to Branch Rickey's office in Brooklyn on Wendell Smith's way back from a tryout in Boston to which he escorted Jackie and two other black ball players um, which was just a PR stunt for Boston. They were never going to sign black players. But on the way back, Branch said, hey, come on, stop by my office. And it's Wendell Smith who recommends Jackie Robinson to Branch Rickey. Did you know that? I mean, how many mm -hmm. people know that? 
Um, Ricky was thinking Satchel Page. He was thinking uh, a lot of different players. Smith is like, no, don't get a pitcher. That's once every five days. You want an everyday player, and you need somebody with the, in, the moral integrity and fire of Jackie Robinson. So that's my guy. That's, that's Wendell Smith. But that's, uh, but that's such an important story because it kind of yeah. really changes – because growing up, you always hear about Jackie Robinson, especially on Black History Month. He's one of the big ten, but you don't hear really the story. You just assume he was really great. He was dynamic. And Branch Richie just uh, scout saw him and said, hey, let's just take him. Right. But you don't know. So that, but that changes That's right. Things. Clyde, Clyde Sukeforth, the scout for the Dodgers, always gets the credit for discovering Jackie. Well, discovering Jackie is kind of ridiculous. He played one season for the Monarchs. He was a football player, mm -hmm. primarily. I mean, he was yeah. a five-sport athlete mm -hmm. at UCLA, but he was not a quintessential black league ball player. There were so many others, uh, including even Buck O'Neill, who yeah. we know through the, uh, the documentary. So, yeah, it's a complex story, and Wendell belongs in that story because you see it in 42 for the first time. Once Jackie joins the Dodgers, well, who's going to find him housing in St. Louis on the road? St. Louis, a virulently segregated town, where's he going to stay? He can't stay at the hotel. Mm -hmm. Well, Wendell had to go find a black family that would host Jackie while he was there. Same in spring training and everywhere they went. So uh, Smith made $50 a week from the Dodgers. He made $50 a week from the Courier. So he, he had two full-time jobs, uh, one for Jackie and, and Branch and one as a sports editor. So it was, uh, it was a great deal of th thought and planning went into this. It was not just an arbitrary signing of a great From player. both sides, Dodgers and Wendell Smith, Jackie Robinson, and, and I'll call it loosely the black community. I know that's, that's, that's oversimplistic, but yeah. Huh. Um, well, we need another movie then, don't we? We need several. <laughs> <laughs> But well, that's a good point, too, because you asked about the, the Bingo Long. The clowning aspect, the, the Harlem Globetrotters dimensions to black ball towards its end, because that was the only way it could survive yeah, as an thinking. enterprise, is to be sort of a, an amusement act thing. Um, that's a real problem. That's another reason Negro Leaguers don't really want much to do with that particular movie, because they were serious. They were, you know, in every way, major league ball players. But looking from it from the outside, it was a necessary evil yeah, yeah. for those people who wasn't making it to the next league. Because everybody, as you say, clearly everybody didn't just get signed the next year. Right. Like, Jackie, so what do you do now to get people in the, in the stands when everybody wants to go see Jackie? You, you had to do something. Right. And, but but I, I see that happening in so many different forms. That when integration, when we stop, when integration begins, a lot of black businesses and a lot of things had to find another way to survive because it just really just dried up overnight. Almost. That's right. And I, I, that's an important part of the story, too. It's an impossible business model yeah. because you own a team, you, you, get, you make your schedule after the white teams have made their schedules because you're in the same parks and, it, and their owners own the ballparks. Mm -hmm. So you've got second choice dates. You can only play during the, the weekends because your fan base works all week. Uh, if it snows, and it's going to snow in the Midwest, it's going to snow, you, you lose your games. It's just, how, how did these leagues and teams ever survive? Thank God they did um, to give us not only that, that chapter of history and, and of baseball, but to uh, make possible Jackie. Because the, the person, Rube Foster, who f founds the Negro National League along with uh, five other owners, his idea was for his American Giants to integrate baseball, the whole team. Mm. So he would be playing the the Dodgers. He would be playing the Cards. Of course, it didn't it didn't yeah. work out that way for him. But he was thinking on a big scale. All right, we've got not well. We've got about three minutes left. We need to hear about the yes, guest who's thank coming. You. Well, I brought. Uh, I don't know if this. Yep, there it is. This is uh, one of the many books by Larry Lester who's coming. Uh, Larry is just a, just a saint, a wonderful human being, co-founder of the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum in Kansas City, uh, a historian, obviously. In fact, it's Larry who led the, uh, the effort 
um, funded by, authorized by Major League Baseball to create a statistical database and record of Negro League Baseball. And guess where they find that? Newspapers, black mm -hmm. newspapers, because that, that's the only place you can find statistics. And when you only use last names in your box score, <laughs> <laughs> so tracking Mr. Smith, for example, <laughs> yeah. from city to city, team to team, league to league, really hard. Anyway, he led that effort. He's coming to talk about 100 years since the founding of black baseball, and he's focusing on uh, why should it matter today? Why should it, since it really is largely a, a remnant of the past, why should we have these conversations? Why should we talk about this chapter of history in 2020? So that's his main focus. And then the, so he, uh, for the luncheon over at the Rome History Museum, which is Thursday, February 27th, um, we're bringing in also Mr. Haynes, who's appeared on this show. That's where I learned of him and uh, Mr. Scruggs with the Monarchs via Huntsville, Alabama. So that's going to be a trick, but we're going to get him here and he's going to be at the luncheon. Yeah. And so that will be just, I wouldn't miss yeah. that for anything in the world. Yeah. That's going to be a hoot. Yeah. It's going to be terrific. Um, and then at the evening, the five o'clock lecture, public lecture by Larry on this topic of, so what? Why, why, do, why should we attend to this, this story in 2020? That's the plan. Now I know the, uh, the luncheon, has a ten dollar charge for the lunch primarily. Gives you a lunch, that's right, and the uh, round tables, and it should be very intimate and just really collegial and, and delightful. Good. And um, is um, the talk at Barry that evening, is that open to the public? Absolutely open to the public, absolutely free. It's in McAllister Auditorium in our science building. Uh, our students get cultural events credit. I mean, you can have the, the cultural events credit too, but, uh, but yes, absolutely. I would open use them, but. Right, right. It's a big deal at Barry to get oh, yeah. CE credit. <laughs> how, how long has that museum been open? The Rome History Museum? No, no, no. The, oh, um, the Kansas City. That's a great question. I'm, I'm going to, I'd be a total guess, so I don't want to do that. Okay. Uh, but it's been around a long time. And if you're ever in Kansas City, it is, it is connected to under the same roof as the Jazz Museum. It's a camp, it just should not miss. Wow. And one block away is Arthur Bryant's barbecue. I mean, you'd have <laughs> the best day of your life visiting this place. Sounds like oh, a, well, and if you go, go out, oh, here's the best part. If you go out of the museum and look to your right, that's the YMCA that the Negro Leagues were founded in. There's no sign, oh, but wow. that's the building. Uh, that's great. This sounds like a field trip. All right, we are coming up on a, another break. Uh, when we get back, we'll give you some of the event details again. So if you need to get something to write with, get it now. Uh, we will be back right after this. Your life is filled with opportunities to show the world you can take charge. It's waking up each day with a mission. It's working each day toward a goal. It's choosing to rise. It's charging forward with a purpose. It's changing the course of your life and taking charge of your future. If you're ready to be a Take Charger, enroll at Georgia Highlands College today. Welcome back to Community Watch. We've been talking with Dr. Brian Carroll about Negro Leagues baseball and about a very special guest speaker we'll have in in Rome on Thursday, the 27th of February, Thursday, the 27th of February. He's going to speak, Larry Lester, correct? Correct. Uh, we'll be speaking at the Rome History Museum uh, at the noon hour. Correct. Uh, there'll be a, a lunch. There's a $10 charge for that. I think you need to get your tickets in advance. Through the Rome Visitors Bureau or I think also at the museum, but definitely the Visitors Bureau and there's also uh, an online Option. And then he'll be speaking at Berry College that, that evening, of, and that's free of charge at, at what time? 5 p.m. 5 p.m. So you want to hit both of those events if you can. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. And thank you for being with us. We'll see you next time on Community Watch. <laughs>